everyone, this is Aurora with Supercharged Science, Homeschool Science Resources for K-12. through And today we're going to talk about the five, maybe six or seven, numbers that really tell you uh, how good a telescope is and really what it's for. So if you like this and you want more, let as many people know as you can. Just share this information so we can help bring education to as many people as are interested in astronomy. So you can also um, find us on Facebook as well as Instagram and tons of places, but just Google Supercharged Science and you will find it. If you want to download those free astronomy lessons, make sure you go to www.superchargedscience.com slash astronomy. I put together a little lesson packet just for homeschoolers. Okay, so when you buy a telescope, we're going to talk about binoculars too. Aren't these huge? <laughs> when you buy a telescope, um, the number one question I usually get is, what power do I need to buy? And that actually, when you buy it, the power, the magnification, same thing, are like the least important thing that you need to know. Um, it's the least important consideration that, that astronomers use. So instead, the key to observing like fine detail, whether you're looking at clusters or binary systems or two stars going around each other, whether you're looking at the moon or planets, it's the light collecting ability. So these things are light buckets. And so the larger the telescope, the more light that can come in. And that's what you really want. So it's the diameter of the primary mirror. Now this is a schmidt cassegrain telescope, which means instead of being normally this long, like here, let's see if I can rotate it here for you so you can see it. Oh, where is it? <laughs> it was under the lens cap. Normally being, you see how it's really short? Like it's just this, this long, but it's heavy because normally this tube would be about twice as long, maybe a little bit more. Um, instead, what they've done is they put some extra mirrors in here. So the light comes in, bounces around, and then goes out the eyepiece back here. Okay, so uh, a telescope, uh, for example, of um, so, so the key to observing is how, how large, what the aperture is, what the diameter of that primary mirror in the back. Now this one happens to be eight inches. So that's a pretty good sized telescope. So a telescope that has a mirror, say if, if we use millimeters, say 200 millimeters, collects four times as much light as the same telescope it was, if it was just 100 millimeters. And that's because um, the light collecting ability is directly proportional to the area of the mirror. Remember how to cal calculate area? Pi, r, pi d squared over r, pi r squared. So that's where that square comes in. So the larger the telescope, you're actually getting four times that amount. So that's pretty cool. So once the light falls on that primary mirror that's back there, see, can you kind of see it back there? Once it falls on there, it, um, the mirror is curved in a certain way that allows all of that light to come together into a focus. And when those lights come, so the distance from that mirror to where all those rays converge together into a focus, uh, we call that the focal length. And that's really important. So if you've ever had done photography before, you've probably heard of focal length, right? Okay. So the focal length is the distance between the primary mirror or lens if you're using a refractor. Uh, they don't have mirrors, they're just lenses. Um, the distance there to where all the, that light comes into focus. Okay, so if you've ever heard of F number, so it's the mirror's focal length divided by the aperture. So this one has a focal length of about a thousand millimeters. And say, just for the math, because we're doing it out loud, if it's 100 millimeters here, you take 1,000 divided by 100, now we have an F number of 10. So it's really easy to calculate. And um, typically, the F number will be printed on it, and, oh, it is, actually, the F number is 2,000 millimeters. It's printed right there. So you can see how easy that is. You just divide that F number that's usually printed on the body somewhere by what the diameter is, and that gives you your F number. Okay, so that's the focal ratio, the F number, the F stop, all the same thing. So, um, and it's a long focal ratio will mean that it's got higher magnification and a narrower field of view. So when you're looking in here, when you're doing your um, astronomy, you'll actually see a smaller piece of the sky um, if you've got a longer focal ratio. And if you want to see things like the Milky Way and you want to look at like globular star clusters, which happen to be good or open star clusters, um, you want to pick um, an F number that uh, is lower than that. So if you want to see details of the moon and the planets and like binary systems, then you want a higher F number on your telescope. And so now you know how to calculate that. <laughs> so how are we doing so far? So that's number number, actually number two. So we did aperture and F number. Okay. Oh, and we also did focal length. 
So by the way, if you just joined us, my name's Aurora, Supercharged Science. We are talking about optics and telescopes. And I'm gonna show you my giant binoculars here in just a minute. Okay, so, oh, I should also mention that that F number, it also will change the brightness of the objects that you can see. For example, um, in a scope with a focal um, ratio is like F5, you'll actually see an image four times brighter than like an F10, but it'll only be half as big. So you gotta play one for the other. Um, it, just, it just depends on what you wanna use. You know, like you use a fork over here, but if you're using a spoon, if you, I mean, you'd rather use a spoon for soup, right? You just gotta use the right instrument for the right situation. Does that mean you need like 10 telescopes? No, it means that you start somewhere in the middle where you actually can find a scope that can actually do both pretty well. Um, and then as you, get more, as you find out what you like more and more, then you can kinda um, uh, pick up more scopes in that area. Okay, so there are times when you want, might want to know the magnification of, that you're using with your telescope. And the magnification of a telescope changes with the eyepieces that you use. And I happen to bring my case down here that you can't see. Oh wait, I had this image. Look at this. Look at, I actually printed it backwards so you can read it. Um, this is how to find the magnification. Look, see that? So the, we're going to take the focal length of the telescope and divide it by the focal length of the eyepiece. What's an eyepiece look like? This one's one of my favorites. It's a, look at that, the focal, oh, it's backwards, but you can see that's a 17, right? So this is the focal length of an eyepiece, and they're usually printed on the eyepiece, or sometimes if they're smaller eyepieces, they're up here or around there. It's usually, so it's easy, right? And this focal length was already printed uh, on the telescope, so now you see how easy it is to find magnification. Put the big number over the small number, and you've got your magnification. Pretty easy, huh? So this plops right into the back of here. Now notice, if I take this out and I put another eyepiece in, does my magnification, my power change? Absolutely. So the telescope focal length divided by the ocular, or the eyepiece, um, is gonna give your magnification. Now typically the most useful magnification, the most useful you get is about 50 times the aperture if it's measured in inches. So this one's eight inch, say it's 10 inches, but easy math. So 50 times 10 is 500. So don't expect to get more than 500x out of this. Um, so you'll see this, for example, like at, um, thing, if you ever buy, don't ever buy a telescope from Walmart, don't ever buy one from Kmart or from any of those places, Costco, um, because it'll say 1200x. You can't get much more than 50, uh, I'm sorry, 500x out of this one without the images being blurry, without them being like all um, like fuzzy and dim. Um, that's just a marketing thing. Don't fall for it. Got it? <laughs> okay. So, um, so you don't want to frustrate your kids with science because if you spend money on something, you don't want them just to throw it on the shelf. I mean, you'd rather spend that money on yourself for dinner one night, right? <laughs> so, um, so this is actually one of the, uh, the most common things we hear is, oh, I just my son this telescope he pointed at the moon and then it was really hard and he couldn't figure it out and then the plastic piece broke off what do I do and now it's trash um, that's because it was trash to begin with <laughs> so if you want telescope and uh, um, recommendations I'll give those to you at the end don't let me forget by the way if you just joined us I'm Aurora with Supercharged Science we are looking at the optics of telescopes what are the numbers on a telescope you should be looking for so we talked about the telescope being a light bucket the aperture the size of the um, the diameter of the primary objective, the thing back here that's collecting all the light. We talked about how um, the length that those, those rays come together, and we talked a little bit about eyepieces and magnification. Okay, now the true field view, you can't talk about this without being a true field of view. What time is it out there? <laughs> uh, right now it's 12.30 in the afternoon. So hi, Joe. Um, so yeah, if, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in so I can answer them as we go along. Okay, so it's 12.30 Pacific time. I live in sunny California and it is sunny again today. So, but I love the snow, just mostly because I've never been in it. So if you have snow, um, I wish I could come visit you. Okay, so <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the true field of view. Okay, so anytime you look in here, you're going to see a circle and you're going to see whatever it is you're looking at, right? Same thing with binoculars. You'll have two, oh, here, let me take these off. Um, you'll have two, and as your brain will put those images together into one. So that's your field of view. So it's a circle of the sky. You look out with a telescope binoculars. Generally, the lower the mag magnification, the wider the field of view. That's why telescopes have these things on them. This is a finder scope. 
because this telescope is so zoomed in on a small section of the sky, it's really hard to find what you want to look at. So suppose you're like, I want to look at the Orion Nebula tonight. It's going to be really hard if you're just looking through here, if you really don't know where you're going. Um, and so what they do is they put smaller telescopes on larger ones because this one has a wider field of view. I'll be able to see more of the sky so I can aim better. And then this is like my zoomed in close in view. Does that make sense? So that's typically why you'll find finder scopes. A lot of astronomers will have one of these and they'll also, not that big, they'll also carry a pair of, let me take these off the tripod, a pair of these to kind of help them because if the sky is dark enough, the first thing they'll do is they'll look on their charts or they'll look on their app and then they'll go, oh yeah, it's right around there. And then they'll look in here and then they'll look in here. So these astronomers use these all the time. Okay. So let me talk about pupil diameter and then exit pupil and then we'll talk about binoculars and how you can stargaze tonight and what is the one cool thing that's going to happen in dawn tomorrow morning before you wake up. So if you're an early riser, you don't want to miss it. There's only one night this is happening and it's tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, okay, exit pupil. That is the, so if I had a, well here, I'll just use the finder scope. So the exit pupil, so if you went to the eye doctor and you said, what is my exit, what is my pupil's diameter? They'll put a little ruler or a little matchup card up to, up to your eye and they'll say, oh, you're seven millimeters or six millimeters. And the older you get, the smaller that number is and the less your eye is able to open. So it, it just gets less and less flexible. So kids and, and grown-ups up to about 40, 50, 60 usually have an, a, a pupil diameter of about six to seven millimeters. What does that mean? That means if the telescope delivers 10 millimeters, a cone of 10, or a, a cone, a cylinder of 10 millimeters of light to your eye, your eye's gonna go, whoa, whoa, too big, too much, too much information, right? But if it only delivers like 0.1 millimeters, it's, you're not gonna see anything, it's not like darkness because there isn't enough light coming into your eye. So the amount of light coming in has to be within a certain range in order for you to sense it, detect it in your brain and to make sense out of it. Okay, so what does that mean? So that means when you look for it at optics, especially like eyepieces, it will usually have information on in the instruction booklet that will tell you what the exit pupil diameter is. So um, any larger, too much light for your eye to accept. Anything smaller, it's going to look dim. You won't be able to see very well, that sort of thing. So how do you find the exit pupil of your telescope? So you're going to take your aperture and you're going to divide it by your magnification. Remember how we did figured out magnification, we had the focal length of the big guy divided by the focal length of the little guy, which is printed here. So we take that number, and uh, so we're taking the eight, uh, so we convert eight inches to whatever that is in millimeters, and we divide it by magnification. That's my exit pupil. So that'll tell me how much light is coming out and if it's useful. Okay, so now let's talk about binoculars. Because honestly, telescopes, they are pretty useless if you don't know where to point them. Even if you have an app, even if you have a green laser, can you find M1? It's up tonight for the Northern Hemisphere. Do you have any idea where that is? It's actually kind of hard to see. <laughs> but it's a, a star that went supernova about a thousand years ago. Was as br it was bright, bright enough to be seen day and night for like two months. It was recorded in, across uh, the Northern Hemisphere in their, um, in their archives and tapestries and engravings and so forth. Um, so it's still up. It's, um, it takes a long time for these um, stars to dissipate, all their gases to dissipate, but you can actually still see it. And so it's actually almost straight overhead as soon as uh, sunset hits for my, um, for my location. So here we are. Best, better than telescopes are a pair of binoculars. So most binoculars, you know, if you want to figure out the power, the magnification, you could do that. You could open up the instruction booklet and you divide the focal length of the tube by the focal length of the eyepiece. Sound familiar? Um, and you would be able to tell what that is. So this one actually has 150 millimeters and this is 15 millimeters. 150 divided by 15 is 10. You could do that. Or there's a cheap, easy way. These are 10 by 50s. The first number, 10, is the number, uh, that's the magnification, that's the power. So when I look through here, I am seeing 10 times larger than life. So if I'm looking at somebody's, you know, license plate number, I can actually see that 10 times bigger than I would with just by regular eyes. Now the 50, that's going to be the, um, in, it, it'll be in millimeters of the objective, okay? So that's the objective in millimeters, so 10 by 50s. Now, if you're curious about these, I just got these, these were amazing. These are huge, look at this size. And here, let me tilt this down. 
me unlock this so you can kind of see the size. Isn't that enormous? Look. <laughs> so these are 10 by 50s. These are 20 by 100. So what does 20 mean? Magnification power, it's, tw it's 20, right? So I can see 20 times as much. And 100, what, is, what do you think that means? That means the diameter here is 100 millimeters. Yeah, it's like two telescopes put together. It, they're incredible. And what can I see in these? I've actually been using these almost every night and not hauling out the telescope because this is so lightweight and it's on an amazing tripod. Um, so these are binoculars that you can get, but I would recommend just a regular pair of binoculars you already have around the house. Okay. The last thing I want to mention, by the way, my name's Aurora with Supercharged Science. We are talking about optics and the most important numbers you need to know that will tell you everything you need to know about your telescope. So we talked about aperture, light collecting ability, di diameter. We talked about focal length, how you get all those rays of light to come together and how far that is. We talked about F ratio and how that changes what you can see, whether it's fine detail or whether it's bigger and brighter. Uh, we talked about the field of view. That's that circle of light that you see when you look through here uh, or through here. We talked about magnification or power as well for tel telescopes as well for binoculars. The last thing is res res blah, 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 <laughs> resolving power, resolution. So resolution is directly proportional to the size of your telescope. So the aperture of like, so if I have a 200 millimeter telescope, I'm going to be able to resolve details twice as well as a 100 millimeter telescope if everything else is the same. So what does that mean? That means that if the larger the telescope, the more dots in the sky I'm gonna see. So if I'm looking at a globular cluster, which is like a New York City, um, kind of a beehive buzz ball, <laughs> fuzz ball of um, stars. It's like a big star ball. If I look at it with a small scope, it's gonna be fuzzy and blurry, and I'll, I'll see those, they're kind of stars, but if I look at a larger telescope, it'll have a greater resolving power, and I'll be able to see pinpoints of light. They'll actually look like diamonds that I'm looking in when I look in the telescope. And that's why when people, <laughs> that's why people spend a lot of money for big telescopes, because they finally know where to point the thing by using one of these, and now they're ready for like big, two-story tall telescopes. And the resolving power in there is just unparalleled. You just can't beat aperture. Okay, so if you enjoyed this and you'd like more, I've got two different options for you. The first one, go to www.superchargedscience.com slash astronomy. Download your free astronomy booklet today. Use it with your kids. And it includes what's up in the sky tonight. Oh, I have to tell you what's up in the sky this tomorrow morning too. Don't let me forget. Um, and the second thing is if you would like more lessons, including how to make your own telescope, both a refractor and a reflector, if you want to learn how to detect cosmic rays, which are currently like bombarding us like all the time, if you want to make battery free radios um, that just use the energy from the signal itself in order for you to hear it, if you want to make laser light shows, uh, which are super cool that project big cool images on the wall, um, and this and so launch your own rockets, make your own hovercraft, if you want to, if those sound good to you and it sounds like you'd like to learn some science, and physics and chemistry along the way, um, then you want to go to www.superchargedscience.com slash easy. Like, wow, that was so easy. My kid is learning chemistry of a comet and I don't even have to do the teaching myself. Everything's laid out for you. There are years and years and years of K through 12 science just for you, all ready to go. The link, it looks like just came up in the comments. You can click on it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. What's happening tomorrow morning? That's a question. Okay, so what is happening tomorrow morning? So tomorrow morning, um, so do you remember years and years ago, I forget which year it was exactly, 2003 or something like that, Mars was as close as it could possibly get and the media went crazy and showed big beautiful images of, of, of Mars and it looked like it was as big as the moon and then when you actually saw it, it was like, <laughs> you know? So Mars is going to be close again. It won't be nearly as close as it was back then. But what's really cool is if you look at it through a telescope, so if you have some of the telescope that you can drag out of bed this early in the morning, um, hot chocolate might be in order, um, and have them pointed at the moon before the sun comes up, you'll actually see the moon and Mars coming out from behind the moon. And you'll be able to snap a picture. You can take it with your uh, with your iPhone. You can take it with you know just any 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 way you could normally take a picture of the moon. It's easy to take a moon with cell a picture of the moon with a cell phone. So you can do that as well. And so you'll see Mars peeking out, coming around the side of the moon. And so you actually get a, a around the dark side of the moon. So you'll actually get a really cool photo of both the moon and Mars. And tomorrow morning is the only time it's going to happen. 
within like the next, what, 10 years or something. So if you'd like to give that a try, go for it. I would recommend starting tonight when you see the moon come up. It's actually coming up kind of late. Uh, just due to the phase that it's in, but try snapping a few pictures of the moon, go to bed, set your alarm, wake up in the morning and take some pictures and then post them because I want to see what you did. <laughs> so did you know that 70 comets were discovered last year and some of them by amateur astronomers? Amateur means you don't get paid for doing astronomy. It doesn't mean you're not good at it. It just means you got a telescope, you're in the backyard and you're having fun. So um, you never know who's going to discover the next something. Okay, so if you like this and you want more, go there. Um, also look in my video archives. We learned, I taught you guys how to make a comet la uh, last week using chemistry, which is a really cool experiment. Tons and tons of great feedback on that one. Thank you so much. And, um, and so yes, one of the questions was, can I use pencil lead to make the comet? And the answer is yes, because it's graphite, it's carbon, that will totally work. All right, if you're looking for telescope recommendations, I recommend going to Orion Telescopes. We do not get a commission. This is just my personal, what I've used and what I like, um, because they've got the best bang for your buck. Um, and buy a Dobsonian. They're not up on a rickety tripod. They are down low. Kids can't knock them over, and the eyepiece is low, so you can actually see through them. Um, I would recommend, you can build your own. They just send you the parts, and then that could be a whole science experiment in itself. Um, they come with go-to ability, so you just have like a keypad like this, and you go, do, 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 go here. <laughs> or you can, um, which I recommend, because if you're learning the night sky, that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, I would just recommend getting a regular six inch, maybe eight inch if you can afford it. Usually only a few couple, there's only, I think they're only a couple hundred dollars, three, four, five hundred dollars max. Um, uh, Dobsonian, uh, they're, uh, they're great trainer telescopes for getting started. Um, honestly, before you buy a telescope though, unless you really, really want one, um, I would just recommend getting a good pair of binoculars. These are Orion as well. These are ultra views. These are 10 by 50s. They're about 10, 15 years old maybe. They're fantastic. I still use them all the time. And so I think that concludes for today. If you've got more questions, don't forget to send me an email, aurora at superchargedscience.com. Also, don't forget your free downloads, aurora, uh, aurora, superchargedscience.com slash astronomy. So you can go ahead and download those as well. And I look forward to hearing how this went with you and your family. And by the way, feel free to share this with everyone. This information is free. Anybody who wants to learn about the night sky should be able to do that. And so the reason I can give you awesome quality videos like this with real hands-on science in them is because you guys have been kind enough to pass this message along to others. So help me reach as many families as possible. Send them the link to this video. If you can think of somebody who really has got a kid who just really loves the night sky and would just eat this information up, just pass it along to them. They can get their own copy of the astronomy download as well and also learn how to tell what's up in the night sky. So I look forward to seeing you and your family and, and seeing the, um, the images that you take and all the cool things you can do. And I will see you guys soon. Thank you everybody so much. I'll see you next time.